this is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Tonight we're heading back to Minnesota, so let's get into it. It's tough for just about anyone to process what they're seeing in the trial over the killing of George Floyd. We talked to a psychologist who's helping young adults deal with these real world scenes of violence. And we're checking in on the vaccine rollout abroad as some parts of the world fall behind in its fight to end the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, here's what you need to know right now. Today, Minnesota prosecutors charged the now former police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright with second degree manslaughter. In less than a week, Reverend Al, in less than a week, the district attorney made the decision that we will charge this officer and the family of Dante Wright will get to have their day in court. So we say justice for Dante Wright. Kim Potter, a 26-year veteran of the Brooklyn Center Police Department, resigned Tuesday. Wright's killing on Sunday sparked unrest and protests in Minneapolis that quickly spread to other major cities across the country. Dante Wright! Dante Wright! Body camera footage from the scene released earlier this week shows Potter screaming taser before she shoots. She can also be heard in shock after saying she shot him, confusing her gun for her taser. Some people have questioned how that can happen. The Brooklyn Center Police Department policy manual also states that all taser devices shall be clearly and distinctly marked to differentiate them from the duty weapon and any other device. Tasers, of course, also have a different weight and feel to them than the gun Potter carried. Unfortunately, there have been other cases like this, with officers claiming a shooting was accidental, but it is pretty rare. What's even more rare, the officers facing charges in those situations. In most other cases similar to this one, there was little to no jail time. If Potter is found guilty, she faces up to 10 years in prison and a $20,000 fine. I believed that our presence in Afghanistan should be focused on the reason we went in the first place, to ensure Afghanistan would not be used as a base from which to attack our homeland again. We did that. We accomplished that objective. The president says he's ready to end the two-decade war in Afghanistan. Today, the U.S. has roughly 2,500 soldiers there. The new plan is to withdraw them by September 11th, with a phasing out process starting May 1st. Public opinion polls show most Americans do want this war to end, but critics of the plan to withdraw are worried the Taliban will swoop in to fill the vacuum. U.S. intelligence officials say that's not likely, at least in the short term. Those officials also say without troops on the ground, collecting intel on possible terror attacks will be a tougher task. When the time comes for the U.S. military to withdraw, the U.S. government's ability to collect and act on threats will diminish. That's simply a fact. Biden says his administration will continue to support peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban and assist when it can. Since the war began in 2001, it's killed more than 2,200 U.S. troops, wounded 20,000, and cost as much as $1 trillion. The estimated civilian casualty count ranges from 30 to more than 43,000 people. Bernie Madoff, the mastermind behind the largest Ponzi scheme ever, died today. He was 82 years old. Back in 2009, Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison for using his business to steal billions of dollars from his clients. The scheme was fronted through a Wall Street firm he founded in 1960 and ran until his arrest in 2008. He swindled thousands of people, including big name celebrities like Kevin Bacon and former talk show host Larry King. In total, prosecutors estimate it was a $68 billion scheme. A quarter of that stolen money was never returned. The lie began unraveling in 2008 when investors started to make withdrawals from his fund because of the financial crisis. Madoff confessed his scheme to his two sons, who reported it to police the next day. Florida is set to pass one of the most restrictive laws on public protesting in the nation. So now these rioters are going to think twice, especially in Florida. I think the bill is a first step to creating a police state. The state Senate took up the bill today. The Republican governor first proposed it following unrest in Tampa last year. The bill beefs up penalties for crimes committed during protests, creates a felony charge for mob intimidation, keeps those arrested during demonstrations in jail until their court appearance, and makes destroying a historical structure, plaque or flag, a second degree felony. Opponents of the bill say it's way too vague and could be used to target communities of color and silence free speech. What this bill does is muddy the waters and it uh, is meant to confuse 
peaceful protesters. Democrats in the state say if the bill is passed into law, they will likely challenge it as unconstitutional. Throughout the Derek Chauvin trial, onlookers have been confronted with the death of a black man at the hands of police several times. And the death of Dante Wright is compounding some of that repeated trauma, especially for young people. Newsy's Jamal Andrus spoke to one health professional who says teens and young adults are particularly in need of counseling when traumatizing events occur. From the streets of Brooklyn Center to the steps of the Hennepin County Courthouse, mental health experts say Minnesota youth are struggling to grapple with the fatal encounters with law enforcement that have scarred their communities. The compiled trauma and the compound trauma um, is really, really um, uh, hurtful for our teens right now. Jason Clopton is a mental health professional in the Minneapolis area who specializes in counseling teens and young adults, two age groups that he says are far too often overlooked when traumatizing events occur. It's devastating. It's it's devastating. It's it's debilitating almost um, to a point where our children aren't able to engage in day-to-day -day functioning. Clopton says he's been working to help youth process the ongoing trial of Derek Chauvin for the death of George Floyd, a task that has only taken on more weight as the trial heads towards jury deliberation. What would a not guilty verdict uh, mean for the city and for the students that you work with? I had a 17-year-old open my mind up to this in a way that I hadn't looked at it before, Jamal. I had a 17-year-old say to me, you know, everybody is worried about uh, what we're going to do if the verdict comes back not guilty. Um, and me and my boys was talking the other day, and we're worried if the verdict comes back guilty. Because don't act like these white folks ain't shooting up churches and like they're not storming capitals. They shoot police officers and go into... Uh, communities and shoot at nail salons and do these things and they don't die and they get to get taken into custody. And Clopton says the mental and emotional toll of this case for many teens has only been amplified by the death of Dante Wright. Wright, a young black man who was shot and killed during a traffic stop by a white female police officer just miles away from where the Chauvin trial is taking place. Dante Wright was 20 years old. Does, the, does his age make this more difficult for the people that you work with, you know, from a psychology perspective? A ton of difference. Um, it, it's the relational aspect um, of being able to really connect more with someone who is of your age group that you're uh, more uh, around more, right? Um, students may have bumped into Dante in crowds at games and things like that, whereas it's uh, almost more un unlikely, right, that they're bumping into George Floyd uh, as much as they would a Dante if they're around his age. But as difficult a time as youth have been having in processing these events, Clapton says he is seeing promising signs of resilience as well. I've seen children step up in ways that, um, you know, is phenomenal, where they're finding their purpose uh, through these experiences, right? Standing on the front line, speaking up about racism, um, oppression, um, and some of the experiences that they have, they're finding their purpose. They're finding that speaking up feels good and comfortable, and that's a space for them to explore. Jamal Andrus, Newsy. What comes to mind when I say the word family? If you say Vin Diesel, then you're going to like how we're about to shift gears. A new Fast and the Furious trailer dropped, which can only mean one thing. Nature is healing. Here's what's trending. Who is he? Jacob is Dom's brother. Yeah, the fastest family feud is back for another high octane romp. In this installment called F9, Dom Toretto and Code take on Dom's younger brother, played by John Cena, who is an assassin and high performance driver who has some world shattering plot. But we don't care about Jacob's plot or the movies, do we? We just wanna see how far they're gonna take things. And by the looks of it, Luda and Tyrese 
might just be going to space. Yeah, it's ridiculous, but this is also a franchise that's brought in more than $5 billion worldwide through 10 movies in a television series. As one writer put it, these movies are the nitrous burning high point of American culture. The entire series is an anti-hero anthem that's also about family. After this film, director Justin Lin will take us through the franchise finish line with two more Fast Saga films. But part of me feels like years down the road, you'll still hear a voice in the distance saying, I live my life one quarter mile at a time. Former Bachelor Colton Underwood is trending after he made a big announcement on Good Morning America. I've ran from myself for a long time. I've hated myself for a long time and I'm gay and I came to terms with that earlier this year and have been processing it. And um, the next step in all of this was sort of letting people know. For those not familiar with the so-called Bachelor Nation, Underwood was on season 23 of The Bachelor. The former professional football player made headlines back then because he was open about being a virgin. In his book, The First Time, Finding Myself and Looking for Love on Reality TV, Underwood mentioned struggling with his sexuality and that his partner at the time, Cassie Randolph, a contestant on his season, helped him realize he was straight. While he has garnered some support since coming out, the internet seems split on his past behavior, especially regarding the restraining order Cassie Randolph filed against him after the breakup. It should be noted that the Bachelor franchise isn't exactly known for its LGBT representation. There's been only one same-sex relationship on screen and has never had an all-gay cast. So it's hard to say what Underwood's disclosure might mean for the franchise going forward. In his GMA interview, Underwood said this about who he is today. I'm still the same Colton everybody met on TV. I'm still the same Colton to my friends and my family. I just happen to be able to share with people now all of me, and I am proud of that. You know, I am proud to be gay. Ice cream maker Ben & Jerry's is trending, and no, it's not because they finally accepted our pitch for In The Scoop with Christian Bryant's Berry Blast. We actually have five other flavor ideas even worse than that, so hit us up. Ben & Jerry's is known for their consistently woke social commentary and they're making headlines again after tweeting support for dismantling the criminal justice system and defunding the police. Both things you don't often ask of your ice cream. Of course, defund the police can be a bit misunderstood in terms of its actual policy implications. Something Ben & Jerry's tackled head on with this inspired photo illustration when they called for defunding the police last year on Juneteenth. You can't say they don't stay on brand. In general, more companies seem increasingly okay with wading into politics these days. In cases like this, they're sure to get some right-wing backlash, and Ben & Jerry's certainly has, but they're also endearing themselves to like-minded folks who also like ice cream. And that's just a big target demographic even when you carve it up along partisan lines. On this show, we've been following up with developments in Tigray, a region in northern Ethiopia, and an alleged massacre that's taken place there in the middle of an armed conflict. Our colleague Jake Godin, whose investigative reporting on this has gotten some international attention, is here to get us up to speed. Jake, what's the latest? Yeah, hey Christian. Um, yeah, we've heard back from the Ethiopia's military force, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. They released a, a press statement um, during a, a kind of a press conference type thing last week where they tried to kind of disprove the stuff that we revealed in our investigation and that CNN revealed in theirs, BBC and theirs. And it's not the strongest argument. While they say that these are filmed in different locations, which kind of disproves that they're a linked incident, we kind of show in our investigation how the videos were around a kilometer apart from each other. In this video that's filmed away from where the massacre took place, there's an individual in a red shirt and kind of a white shawl that you can see sitting on the ground who appears to be in the other set of videos. And he's being walked towards the cliff edge. And then in another video, you can see his motionless body on the, on the cliff side. They also claim that there's no blood visible in the videos, which is kind of absurd because you can see blood on the in the soil. And even after they've been moving the bodies, you can see blood on the rocks. I don't know if they missed that or maybe they're just willfully like ignoring it. Some of the other stuff that they're saying just doesn't really make sense. They're talking about the kinds of cameras that were used to film this stuff. Um, and it's not really relevant 
it, if that's how the ENDF is already looking at this, that doesn't really bode well for any like internal investigations on their part. The United Nations is partnering with a group called the National Human Rights Commission in Ethiopia. They've been charged with investigating various potential war crimes throughout the region or human rights abuses. Any investigation is going to take uh, quite a while. It's going to take, uh, you know, it, it's not going to happen overnight. The gears are probably moving on this kind of stuff, but it's it's all going to ha be happening kind of like outside of a very visible um, kind of uh, presence online or anything like that. Just to, just probably so that the investigation can be conducted without any um, interference or stuff like that. Despite efforts from an international vaccine sharing program, some African nations will have to wait years for the kind of vaccine rollout happening now in much richer countries. When it comes to the fight against COVID, more than 20% of the U.S. population has been fully vaccinated. That number is higher when you take into account the percentage of people who've received at least one dose of a vaccine. But other poorer nations aren't so fortunate. Kenya, for example, has had less than 1% of the population receive at least one dose of a vaccine. Nelson Gunyi, our partner on the ground in Kenya, tells us how the country expects their rollout to last until 2023 and what that can mean for the rest of the world. After a rough start, COVID-19 vaccination programs are currently underway across the continent, with many of its countries urging its citizens to get vaccinated, despite the many challenges facing the rollout program. The first batch of the eagerly awaited COVID vaccine arrived in Kenya on the 3rd of March 2021. The country received a total of 1.02 million doses of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine as part of the COVAX facility. The global initiative that is working with governments and manufacturers to ensure COVID-19 vaccines are available worldwide to both higher income and lower income countries. A month later, the East African country with a population of over 55 million citizens has vaccinated over 500,000 of its people. More questions than answers linger as to why the vaccination process is rather slow in a critical time as this. I've not been vaccinated because I think the, the way the government has handled it, it is too casual. The Kenyan government formulated a vaccine rollout plan for its most vulnerable citizens aged over 58 years and above, as well as frontline workers. We talked to Dr. Willis Akwale, the chairperson of the Vaccine Task Force in Kenya, who explained to us the laid out plan of the government and how far along it is and its practicality. We needed to have a first approach, which was informed by an uh, unstable supply chain of vaccines globally. Uh, we realize that at the moment every country is trying to grab any dose of vaccine that is available. So we set ourselves to have the first phase that would run between March and June uh, and uh, be able to vaccinate about 1.25 million um, Kenyans. We are at the Kenyatta National Hospital, the largest referral hospital in East Africa, one of the vaccination centers where we can see a queue of people awaiting their turn to get a shot of the vaccine. Over 7 million vaccine doses have been administered to high-risk population groups in the continent as of March 2021 with supplies from vaccine-producing countries becoming more limited as they try and manage their own rising COVID-19 cases, there is a glimmer of hope. As fatalities from the third wave continue to increase and the vaccination rollout expected to run until 2023, the main goal now is to vaccinate as many people as possible and as fast as possible. Nelson Nguyen, Newsy, Nairobi. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. If you don't include the Newsy, you run the risk of touching base with another in the loop that we'll eventually have to fight for dominance whenever the two parties decide to choose violence. We don't want that. Y'all ever seen the movie Wally? I promise this is related to the next story. The humans in that film had 
really let themselves go. Everything was automated and they just didn't have the need for substantial physical activity or human interaction at all. There's something really important about humans interacting with each other, especially through touch. National reporter Elizabeth Ruiz spoke to a neuroscience researcher about the impact of the lack of touch and how we can cope with less human interaction during the pandemic. Physical touch. It's one of the five basic senses, and it's a part of our everyday lives. Being social and meeting other people is, I think, the essence of, of being human. If that's taken away, it would be strange if we were not affected by it. Dr. Helena Vossling has spent years researching the human touch system. She says touch impacts how people feel and act. So when the pandemic takes away our ability to physically interact with each other, there's a part of us that feels empty. Touch is not just, you know, intense hugging or massages. It's, it's the everyday touch with just a hand on the shoulder or a pat on the back or just when you emphasize what you want to say to someone, Maybe you hold their lower arm or something um, and just shaking hands, that important ritual that we have just to say hello and, and acknowledge people. And now that we don't have that anymore, it's sort of like a part of our ways of communication is actually lost. Helena says touching somebody can help them feel included, connected and seen, but it can also calm them down. So touch from people to people with lower your blood pressure, um, it will lower your pulse, your heartbeat, and it would also lower the levels of your stress hormones within your system. People who have been isolated for more than a year are likely suffering from loneliness, depression, and anxiety. However, Helena says there are ways to help yourself if you're missing physical touch from other humans. For example, if you have a furry friend, spend some extra time cuddling them or consider offering your body some warmth. Lowering yourself into a warm bath or or having a shower, that's also a tactile experience. Uh, and that activates this part of the nervous system that's an emotional touch system. If you do have the opportunity to see somebody in person, Helena says you can elevate your other senses by being fully present with them. Maybe we should be aware that it's very important when we see each other, even if it's a certain distance, um, that we should meet eyesight, and that we should be better at eye contact. Um, to really, really um, have people feel that they're actually being seen. Um, and if we could use our hearing, for example, all these smartphones that almost everyone has, maybe we should actually use them for what they were intended to, to begin with, um, to have a, a proper conversation. Meaningful human interaction is more important than ever as we continue to navigate this pandemic lifestyle. I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow for more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.